Hello, new friends, old friends. Welcome to something a little bit different. It is the first ever episode of Footy Positive. We don't know what we're going to do, but hey, there is one thing. It is positively assured that we love football, love everything that comes to do with it. And I am joined by my co-host, first time ever, long time friend, Supercoach with DR. How are you? Benny, very, very well, mate. It's an absolute pleasure being able to sit in and chat with you. And what almost started as a bit of a joke, a throwaway line, has now turned into a new potty. So really looking forward, mate, to sitting down with your fellow Lions man. Uh, we met up at the Grand Final. Unfortunately, couldn't come home with the chocolates, but hopefully 2024 is uh, the year of the Lion, uh, as well as the year of us. Uh, hopefully getting a pretty decent ranking super coach, buddy. Yeah, hopefully. I could not get out of the MCG quick enough um, <laughs> oh, that day. Look. But look, you are right. I think with, you know, I know Twitter is obviously known for its positivity, um, but it's been a bit of a, a hell chaotic week on Twitter. And I put out this thing because you're one of the most positive um, some people also call you know the goat, you know, you know this real down to earth ochre. I actually realized today when I was thinking about it, we are complete polar opposites. As in your primary teaching, I'm secondary. Your Fitzroy, I'm the lions. You're down there, I'm up here. <laughs> you, you can grow facial hair, I can't. I mean, we're pretty much polar opposites. But um, before we do move on, in case anyone doesn't know, so for me, it's uh, SC Insider 100. So you can find us on Facebook, Twitter, Twitch, etc. And um, also for you, Dr. Where can people find you? Yeah, just at supercoach underscore DR on X slash Twitter. And that's where I do most of my stuff, mate, obviously apart from the YouTube channel. But uh, yeah, it's been uh, an interesting environment lately, mate. But we are here to talk about the positives. And I think we may need some more positive chat, not only in the supercoach space, but in the world around us, Benny. So uh, I'm looking really forward to uh, sitting down, having a chat with you, mate, and focusing on, on all things good about football and life. Yeah, so if you are not sure about where we're heading, look, you're not alone. But here's where we are sitting at this current point in time. We're looking at um, yeah, how, how we, so we're going to dive a little bit deeper into ourselves today, um, how we sort of look at a positive mindset, how we deal with challenges and adversity. And then we go into like footy, how we fell in love with the game, footy growing up for us, the things that resonate with us, um, football, you know, your heroes growing up, uh, watching football, and then also other little bits of advice that we kind of have to, yeah, that we can sort of share. So not only is it about just putting a bit of that positive love out there, it's about talking about um, you know, how we overcome things and then coming back to football. So if there's something that good happens for the week, we can touch on this. But we've also reached out to a few people as well, a few journalists that we know, uh, a few people embedded within clubs. So we're also trying to see where this takes us. So if you like what we're, you know, what we're, pick, what we're putting down, please let us know because that will then give us some inspiration to continue. This is a almost like a demo, isn't it? We're going to do a few episodes. We're going to see if, if traction hits off. But again, as you said, we just put out a little bit of a tweet as a, a lighthearted joke saying, mate, all this negativity. I said, I should just get with, you know, Supercoach with DR and just talk all positive stuff. And I had like 52 likes, not very long. And everyone's like, I would buy that. So look, give the people what they want is pretty much what we're at. Absolutely, mate. Absolutely. I'm looking forward to I'm um, hopefully getting a bit of traction and, uh, yeah, making this like a bi-weekly thing and getting some special guests on because I think with everyone, mate, we all go through some sort of adversity, whether or not you're a journo, you're a well-known AFL player, or you're just an average Joe like myself, mate. We all go through it. So if we can uh, hopefully give some advice and support and speak with some people that have gone through some tough times and hopefully anyone that's listening uh, may be a little bit better off, mate, which would be awesome. Yeah, I agree. And these are probably sides we haven't even shared ourselves um, as far as the, the deeper understanding of things. But uh, I think that's probably the important part. At the end of the day, the reason we're doing this is because we're in a position that we can. And I think you're a positive lad and we get along really well. This isn't an exclusive Lions thing. However, that is what brought us together. So we do want to share those journeys. All right. So we're going to go starting off first off the bat, right? So DR, how do you maintain a positive mindset? Because you're a positive guy. I don't think I've heard a negative thing come out your mouth unless like the lines have lost and you've you know, you've said shit or something or other. But how do you maintain a positive view? The, the trick is, mate, to make this fake personality like I have on Twitter and my YouTube videos and just go wild when the camera's off, mate. That's how you do it. No, is that a guy, Jim Beam uh, on the head kind of moment? Yeah, yeah, the real DR? Oh, I think some people have seen the uh, video of me with the Jimmy mate over the – yeah over the old scone there in celebration. But look, mate, I, I'm really, really lucky. You know, if we just talk about from a super coach or a YouTube or a content creator's point of view, I've been really lucky 
not to have been trolled too much. I think the community that you build and if you tend to have a pretty positive mindset yourself, then I think most of the people around you will as well. So I have been pretty lucky that I haven't had to deal with too many trolls online. I know lots of our friends have lately, which has been pretty disheartening, but uh, good to see that most of that I think has been taken control of. But when it comes to adversity in life, mate, I think one thing that I always try to look back to is what I'm really thankful for in life. And that's obviously things like my family, you know, you can have a bad week at the footy, but at the end of the day, and look, don't get me wrong, mate, you're a father yourself. And I'm sure there'll be many other dads and parents and soon to be parents that may be watching. There's times in life where you go, why did I become a parent? You know, I love these guys to death, but what am I doing? Why am I doing this to myself? But then at the end of the day, you may have a hard day at work or whatever it is in life, you come home, you see those kids, I've got a little 14-month-old at the moment who's an absolute nutter, love him to death though, but it really does put things into perspective. You know, I've lost a couple of mates in the last 12 months as well and that puts things into perspective. You think, geez, I probably should have reached out some little bit more or spent a little bit more time with them and they're the sort of things that I tend to come back to, mate. Um, glass half full stuff. And it's like, I, I do this as, as a teacher, mate, in primary school, the old catastrophe scale, you know, one to 10 will where does this thing actually lie on the scale? You know, is it at a one where we can just brush it off and we're all good or is it at a 10? You know, it is something really serious mm -hmm. that we, we can get upset about and, um, you know, have some trouble dealing with. So for me, mate, it's coming back to really what you're thankful about. And I think the other thing is, mate, you've got to be able to have a laugh at yourself as well. If you can't laugh at yourself, then I, I don't know who you can laugh at, mate. So I'm never afraid to make a bit of a fool at myself, mate. Wear my heart on my sleeve, show a bit of emotion because I think you've just got to be true to who you are in the end. But, uh, yeah, I'm very lucky for lots of things that I have in life, mate, and always come back to those sort of things, mate. How about yourself, buddy? Is there something that you yeah. tend to come back to when you have a bit of a rough one, mate, or you're going through a rough well, patch? Well, I was thinking it's funny because, yeah, um, you know, catastrophizing, first of all. So we have the, the new mobile phone policy at schools. Kids are blowing up, like, and even on Facebook and everything. They're like, oh, kids can't have their phones for the day. And then someone's like, oh, well, that's well and good until someone dies. Like, cause it just absolutely <laughs> blows it all out of the proportion. Um, I'm definitely more of a, a glass half full kind of guy as in, um, same thing you were saying with, if it doesn't, I don't let too much bother me. So I, I'm happy to joke about myself because if someone says something about me and I let it bother me, then it's almost like they're impacting me and I'm questioning who I am. So I think the first part is, is just getting to know like what you like, what you don't like, what you stand for, who you are as a person, and then everything else sort of comes around that. So as you said, yeah, two kids, one's 11 months and he's a, a nutter compared to my little girl who was sit and read. He just wants to like crawl and get into everything. And, um, and seriously, two kids, it's kind of like Melbourne weather where everything was going great today and then next minute my little daughter just legs it and came up and just disappeared and it's like, you know, like, what are you meant to do? So it, it is that constant battle. Um, if anyone out there is about to have a second, life does get more busy, just more clothes, more stuff, things that you used to split. We used to, you know, one could have a rest and then the other one, you know, it's like, yeah, that's fine. I'll take care of this one. You go have a rest now. It's kind of like there's two. So you, you're outnumbered if you try and do a two on one sort of scenario. Um, yeah, yeah, just, it's just busier, but, um, yeah, you know, very rewarding at the same time. But for me, I think the, just the positive outset that I have is that number one, I think when I go through a tough time and yeah, you know, sometimes you, you feel maybe unlucky in relationships or you're unlucky in a few areas and things that aren't happening for you that you want to. And the more you try and force it, it kind of almost doesn't happen because you're, yeah, you know, you're pressuring it. You're putting, when you're talking to people in those relationships and the communication or through work, it's not as genuine because it seems forced. So I always kind of go back to the, it sounds really weird, but um, it's almost like the, I'm on an island approach. So as in, do I see myself on an island somewhere down the track? Do I see myself happy? Do I, when I look at myself in the future and I think about me in 10 years, do I, do I seem stressed? Do I seem angry? Do I seem anxious? Do I seem alone? It's like, well, no, I actually see myself with a family or with this and, and being happy. And then I kind of use that sort of imagery to then think about, okay, well, don't worry about the now focus on just whatever you do to make you happy and whatever sort of process you get into knowing that I see myself being happy. And it's a really weird thing to say because you don't know the future, but just visualizing yourself 
am I, do I think I will be happy in the future? Do I think I will have this X, Y, and Z? And if you think yes, and you visualize it, then don't worry about the now and that kind of stuff eventuates. And it's worked oh, out pretty well I, I for me so far. So, I love it. It's like you're going overseas to a nice island on a holiday and along the, the way in the plane, there might be a little bit of turbulence, you know, those little short-term speed humps. But, you know, at the end of the day, the destination, the final destination that you're getting to is going to be a lovely one. So really like yep. that analogy, mate. Very, very well, nice. Unless, and- unless you're like that one plane that did disappear. But the plus side is yeah. a lot of people were, a lot of people <laughs> are looking for you. So, <laughs> and you're not alone is the, the important message out of that one. Absolutely. Um, <laughs> but yeah, and it is hard always to try and stay hard, glass half full. I mean, I, I actually I threw my back out a couple of days ago. Don't ask, like just doing oh. stuff around the yard. I was uh, trying to, I had a shoulder reconstruction last year. So that kind of bit mopey, just sitting in the bed, feeling a bit useless back into the gym, doing like loading up bent over rows, getting the strength in the shoulder and then throw my back out, doing the mowing. Like, oh, so you kind of. You go through these things where it's sometimes easy to get caught up in negativity and and absolutely i don't think we're immune to that so i kind of go okay like i threw my back out and i tried to go to the cricket still not a good idea i was hobbling so bad uh, but then the next day i thought right i give myself a window uh i call it the pity party window so for this day i'm like i had maccas i had you know some ice cream custard whatever <laughs> I, I had a little pity party. So I'm like, today I'm going to feel sorry for myself. Love it. And then tomorrow, like, fuck that. Like, tomorrow, no. Like, here's my time. I've done my time. Anything I'm feeling, any negative thoughts, I'm going to give it this time to get it out of my system. And then from there, the next day I go, okay, let's regroup. Because regardless, if you go through down stuff, I think sometimes it will kind of affect you in some way. But if you give yourself a window to go, right, today I'm just going to let it all out, knowing that, you know, this is my time and then I'm going to move on. Otherwise, it can then drag on two, three days, four days, and then you start to let it affect other things. So I just kind of had myself a little pity party, had Macca's cheeseburger meal with an extra cheeseburger. Love and um, yeah, yeah, I was absolutely glutton. Um, <laughs> but that's how I kind of, you know, I learned that through because I think I had glandular fever once and I worked, I didn't rest. I, it took me a long time to get over it. And it just impacted everything like food, relationships, my weight, my mental health. Um, and then I actually ended up speaking to someone and getting some help for the first time, just trying to figure out the main catalyst. So that way, if I do get into this train of thought, you go and you can kind of almost catch it before you let yourself get too far. And yeah. I'm not, I don't know about you, but I'm not a help seeker. Like I've never been good, even at school. If I don't know something, I'm not the type to say, hey, by the way, I don't understand this. I will just try and figure it out myself, and then I would flunk. And oh, I am absolutely even, with you, mate. Yeah, absolutely like, you. and it's the most rewarding and positive thing, and I've thought helped maybe a few times in my life, and I'm still not better at it, but I can say that if you have a lot of stuff on your shoulders, man, sometimes just bringing other people in. And um, so I've had that financially once after glandular fever. My finances went to absolute shock and and um yeah just trying to you know work your way back think of the island and then try and come back that way so i i am someone who has you know paid and spoken to someone for assistance and um you know started to rely on people a little bit more than i had because of how like i was yeah pretty low at that point and this was you know pre-family pre-changing my degree and work and all the rest of it so yeah i'd say now, with better tools to help myself, I can kind of recognize when I do get a little bit self-destructive in thought and patterns to actually try and get myself out a little, a little bit quicker. What about uh, you? Great, great, to, great to hear you. On, on, on a better path now, mate, because we all go through those downs. I think something that you, you touched on that's really important is speaking to the right people. And it is tough to, to speak up at times. And whether or not that, that's a professional, you start off with someone that's really close that you can trust, a family member, or else if you feel like maybe you're a little bit socially isolated. I know many people are still suffering through that, that COVID situation at the moment. The great thing about the super coach and AFL community is that you can get to know people. You can get to speak to people about certain things. Some of my best mates uh, have come from this community uh, that, that we're involved in, mate, this super coach community, AFL community. So I think the most important thing is to make sure that, that you chat with someone, you know, and there's no shame in it, mate. A lot of people, 
that, that I know, lots of my mates think that there is a bit of shame involved in speaking up, you know, the whole man of the house type thing. You've got to make sure that everyone else is okay. But I think a lot of the time that, that I've found anyway, if you don't get yourself right, then you can't really help a lot of other people around you. So I think that it really is important to, to get yourself right, to love yourself as well. We all make mistakes, but again, that's how we grow, mate. You know, I don't think anyone's even close to perfect. And uh, yeah, but the big point there, I totally agree, mate, is, is make sure that you do speak with people. If you need help, don't be afraid to seek it. Yeah, for sure. Um, that's probably the the lowest point of the positive <laughs> footy talk. But uh, <laughs> no, no, is it? It's real though. Like, as in, we don't know where we're going with this as far as, but it is real. Um, and I feel you, and I'm sorry to hear about the people that you have lost. I actually knew three people this year that were aged between 30 to 35 that, um, you know, took their life this year. So I, it's just a, an absolute, um, and even one of them probably hit me harder the most because it was a PT. Like, you look at this person and every single part of their life, that was my life, resonated with me as in their characteristics as a person. Um, yeah, so it's just brutal, which is why the end element is trying to kind of hear yeah, from others even, as in if you did have one tip to kind of give someone, what would it be? But, um, yeah, I think we'll just get into the quickly, though, rewinding back to that positive outset and positive outlook on things. I don't know why people let um, things bother them that they can't kind of impact and influence. So for me, like even with football and super coach, everyone's commenting and worrying about a few things and the changes and worrying about all this external noise. And there's just so much out there in the world. If you stress about every single thing and situation that you can't control, I just feel like it's so much wasted energy when realistically, uh, and I even had people comment to me saying, oh, that's just because you're mates with them, you're trying to suck up to them. I said, no, it's just I don't make the decisions. I actually put out some feedback as in what I would like to happen. They didn't listen to my feedback. I'm like, oh, well, that's fine. Like, it doesn't bother me. And then I look at, oh, 40 trades. I'm like, okay, well, that's interesting more than I was kind of expecting or wanting, but then you just get on with life and you just move on. Like if it doesn't impact you, then why let it impact you? If you can't exactly control right. it and from, you know, relationships from work, I just see people worrying about things and I probably shouldn't mention my partner, but maybe she'll watch this, maybe she won't. Um, but sometimes you go back to that real talk as far as, you know, sometimes it's like, oh, but what if this happens? What if this happens? What if this happens? And when everything feels like the world's falling apart, I'm like, okay, well, if, this scenario happens, then we'll deal with it when it comes. Like there's no point in stressing yourself out, wondering about all the 10 different angles when, you know, you just kind of go, okay, like if this happens, sure, it's going to suck. But when it happens, if it happens, we'll deal with it. We'll go, okay, this is what's going on. We'll make a solution and then we'll deal with it when it comes up. Yeah, exactly right. Because I think if you don't do that, you'll just go around the twist, won't you? Because how many scenarios can you really think up in your head? If you get creative, you can just go on and on and on and on. And by the time you've got to scenario 28, your, your head's just all over the place. So totally agree, mate. If, if it's something that is out of your control, don't stress about it. You know, if something comes that you need to deal with, well, Deal with it at the time, you know, make sure that you're going with some sort of a plan. But if you're worried about what can go wrong in life, I don't think that it's going to be easy for you to really enjoy your life and anything that you're doing. So we know that we all have ups and downs. You can't control that. But uh, one thing that I think is really important to do, as we've mentioned a couple of times, is do your best to have that half, that glass half full approach and look at the positive things in your life worrying, rather than worrying about all the the stressful things in your life. And we look at the great Selby, for example, and what he does with his season guide. It goes to the Starlight Foundation, you know, helping sick kids. They're the things that we should be focusing on, I think, mate, the positive things that we can control. We can buy a guide and we can help out to give a wish to a kid. So they're things that we can control. There's other things that we can't, you know, maybe hateful comments or the behaviour of other people that, that may affect us that is out of our control. But at the end of the day, mate, Focus on the positives. Do what you can do, what is in your control. Do what you think is right and, and just follow your heart, I think, at the end of the day, mate. Yeah, and you're not going to please everyone. I mean, I'm sure Tom Mitchell and Al Patton have figured that one out the, the hard way as far as right. But, you know, you, you can't please everyone. And even then we've had people, you know, comment and, oh, like I'm unsubscribing and I'm unfollowing or, um, you know, just trying to say, oh, stick to, stick to super coach advice, as in when you kind of – you might tweet about something else other than football – and, I'm, you know, as in we just kind of – we're pretty lucky in the fact that we just – it doesn't bother us. I'm like, that's cool. Like, we started this as two guys just recording. So Chris and myself and Swiss came along, obviously. 
um, just recording our opinions because we spoke so much footy that we're like, hey, dude, if we put this out there and you listen, cool. If you don't listen, then it doesn't bother us. And if you want to leave, then that's well and truly good. And then I kind of say, well, it's not football advice. It's more of a, it's a football opinion page. So we'll give our opinions on stuff so you can either enjoy that opinion or you can like, yeah, shut up, uh, which is pretty much how we kind of, of go about it. But it is a, a unique kind of position to not let other people's opinions sort of dictate you. And um, I had this really great uh, video I think I was watching once where saying, you know, if I, if I was talking to you and I was to insult you and I'm like, oh, look at your look at your red hair, look at your crappy red hair, you suck, whatever, whatever, then you would go, I don't have red hair, and you just brush it off like it's not true. But then sometimes when you when people say something else to you, I'm like, oh, you're not funny, your beard's this or whatever, and you kind of then some people go, oh, and they when realistically all you have to do is take the exact same approach and go, no, that's fine, I'm fine. Like that's that what you're saying is not true and just brush it off. And it's right. just about that mindset to kind of go, well, whatever you're saying is I don't know you and you're just someone online. Maybe you're going through some tough times. Maybe you're having a rough day. Maybe you're going through this. But yeah, at the end of the day, if you let words affect you, then, you know, it's just, it's a pretty tough world out there when everyone's at this point in time giving their opinion because they feel like they can give their opinion and their opinion means something and it should be listened to. When realistically, I think growing up, you had all your leaders, you know, your Muhammad Ali's and your Gandhi's and all these people that everyone would listen to and they would be these leaders that would project this inspiration and everyone, you know, they'd be the, the wolves and the leaders and all the sheep would just listen and buy it up. But now all the sheep have, you know, Twitter and social media and not everyone should be heard. So don't yeah, listen to a different world. It really is, isn't it? And I think the other thing oh. is that people are so passionate as well and sometimes I, I think they can let their passion go over the top, I think, and, and and get that little bit personal. And I think lots lots of the time, if people had their time back and maybe just thought about things for an hour before posting a comment or making a comment, then th they would certainly take that sort of stuff back. And I think that's happened in the last sort of week on Twitter as well. Lots of people have said, look, if I had my time back, I probably wouldn't have said this. I didn't really get the context or understand exactly what was going on behind what was said or the meaning behind whatever was going on. So... I think that that's really important as well, mate. You make a very, very good point there. And the good thing is that we're really starting to get positive now. And the other, the other thing that I'll just quickly mention is that I've always got a lot of respect for anyone that, that does content or has their real name or personality out there because you do live and die by what you say and uh, you're not some sort of keyboard warrior that's nameless or faceless that's happy to say what they want and troll and say some nasty things at least – uh, lots of people that I know that are involved um, that are made up now are actually real people with real accounts. We know who they are. They stand by their decisions. Uh, but really good to see that everyone's managed to get back together, mate. And this 40 trades, you know, I'm an old school player. I'll admit 24 trades is where I pretty much started off the game. It might have even, even been less than that. I had some great results during that time. But guess what? We've got to adapt. And something I'm really excited about is the fact that it, basically we're all rookies this year because there's no data, there's no history to say this has been the best way to go about this. We're all in the same boat, whether or not you've been playing for a long time, you've just started up. We're all in the same boat here, 40 trades for the first time. So I'm actually getting really excited about this, mate, because there's some different strategies we can put in place now and uh, a lot that we can tinker with in our sides, a little bit more freedom in some ways. So I love it, mate, and I think we'll just get even more diversity, which is what we want in the game anyway. That's the part I hate the most. I'd, I'd like to – all the decisions I made last year, I would like to kind of think and learn and go, well, did I go at the right time for that? Should I be more aggressive? Do I like that mid-prices strategy or like a half-half? <laughs> yeah. you know, two, two premiums, two two mid-prices to launch off and two rookies, and now I'm like, well, hang on, everything's changed again. So it is the <laughs> it is the – the old scenario where, because I, I like at least some data to kind of, you know, look at what I've done to try and come up with some strategy. But you, know, it, and I think you did say at the the same time when um when you were getting on to um was it more magic the you know poker analogy you had where you know the skillful players and I did listen um the skillful <laughs> players you know they they come out so as in if you have pocket aces but aces can get cracked but you'll find that the the more skilled you are the better um. It, prepared you are with the knowledge and the different strategies, then you are more likely to have success. So it doesn't guarantee success, but obviously you are right where the same people tend to kind of have fairly good finishes more often just because you know they're more used to that sort of strategy and the game plan and the 
you know, who to get in at what point, etc. So that's where I think it's really um, beneficial. Now, I do want to find a little bit about your footy story because I haven't heard this before, right? Now, tell me back. So how did you fall in love with footy? So the nostalgia of footy. How well, did you look, fall in love with it? And is there something that sort of stands out as far as, you know, growing up or, or a moment where you just is the pinnacle of your experience? Yeah, well, look, mate, I, from my earliest memory really is being around the footy as well. So my dad used to play local footy as well. So always around football from a very, very early age. And so my mum's side of the family, they were all very much passionate Fitzroy supporters. My dad and my grandfather over that side were Hawthorne. Then there was a bit of Carlton, North Melbourne. There was 10 kids over that side of the family. So a bit of diversity there. And we were a little bit close with mum's side. They were a little bit closer in proximity to where we lived and all the rest. So Fitzroy boy, right from the start, it was really my nan that was the most passionate. You know, she used to have this old broom cupboard. And on the inside of that, there was, you know, the Alistair Lynch poster up there with Rusey and the newspaper cutouts and all the rest. So I've just loved football, mate, from early age. I used to go every single week that we used to play in Melbourne with the family. And that was, you know, my mum, dad, my brother, nan, pop, cousins, aunties, uncles, uh, family, friends. So there were about 30 of us that used to go. Uh, and that's a big reason why I was so upset and really distraught. I was 12 years old when Fitzroy ended up merging and becoming the Mighty Lions, as we know them today, the Brisbane Lions. But at the time, it was like someone had absolutely ripped my heart out, mate, because Fitzroy was just everything to me. These guys were my heroes, my absolute heroes. You know, I started playing footy. I think I was about, my, I think my dad did a dodgy because he was a treasurer at the club. But you had to be, I think, seven and a half to play in the under 11s. And I was six and a half, I think. So a year younger, all the older boys used to look after me there. So played junior footy right up until under 18s and a bit of senior footy, then had the family in retired a bit but footy is really in my veins mate footy is pretty much my religion and uh very much a fitzroy boy but uh my heroes if i could give you probably my three favorite roy boys at number three i'd probably have alistair lynch always love the man and obviously being a, a crossover player between fitzroy and then brisbane as well it's hard to go past lynch and i've met him numerous times different functions and and all the rest and he's genuinely such a lovely bloke he's always made time for me as a bit of a mad fan, give me five minutes, been extremely nice. And so love him. Number two is Paul Ruse. Um, I think any Fitzroy fan, particularly as a kid my age, you know, captain of the club, all Australian, close to winning a Brownlow. He was just our hero. And again, ripped my heart out when he ended up transferring across to the Swannies. But number one for me, mate, is a great Kevin Murray. Just an absolute gun. Um, hard as, as anything as a player. It's such a soft, lovely man these days. And I've had his brown low around my neck, I reckon, 20 times over the years. And you go you go to the Brisbane family days, mate, and this is the Brisbane Wines family days now. You look at your Lockie Neals, your Josh Dunkleys, and, and all the superstars, the Dan Riches that we've had, the biggest line is always for Kevin Murray because this bloke gives everyone their time. He's just a lovely fella. So top three lines for me, mate. But, uh, yeah, love love the Brisbane Lions now. Um not the same and lots of people do say to me benny that uh, you, you can't complain you know because you've had your three flags in a row don't mind you and you, you're traveling pretty well now but in saying that being a fitzroy supporter it's like every win that we had was like winning a grand final because it was so rare and you'd celebrate like you'd just taken out the gf to be quite honest and i i cannot watch a fitzroy game and i'll say this proudly without tearing up mate it's um it just gets to me i don't know if it's just seeing the jumper um, it, it really does get to me. But look, the way that everything's panned out, very passionate Brisbane Lions supporter now. We did have a really good period there in the early 2000s. Got to go to a grand final, which is good in, in 02, which was really nice. And uh, obviously having a bit of success now, Benny, after it was almost like... So you've seen us win practice. then. You, you've seen the Lions win then. So that's one up on me. I've only seen I them have. lose. Um, so you, what yeah. you're saying is that the Brisbane Lions is kind of like your um your second marriage, whereas your your first That's wife it. was <laughs> you get all teary. Just I just watched back at the old um the old wedding tape and just brought a tear to my eyes. It was just so raw, so emotional. My first love, and now it's you know you you love it, but it's just not feeling the same. <laughs> exactly right, mate. But yeah, no, nah, look, look, do miss Fitzroy, but uh, as I said, mate, we're going very, very well at the moment, and. Uh, could be our year this year, Benny. But 
look, lo- lots of people assume that I'm I'm in Queensland because I barrack for the for the Brisbane Lions of Brisbane, yes, Brisbane even Lions now. But I'm I'm an old Vic boy, mate, being a Fitzroy fella. You are up in Queensland, Benny. So yeah. Tell us about your footy history, mate. Are you a Brisbane oh. Bears supporter or did you sort of get on when the Lions came came through? Have you played yourself? Give us a bit of your background, mate, and uh, how your passion for footy came to. Yeah, so uh, a Brisbane Bears supporter uh, when they used to get flogged every week. So, uh, And then when the success came, obviously it's like everyone jumping on, like Simple Plan. It's probably the best way to explain it. Simple Plan was this, I really digged to them at some point, and then all of a sudden all the teeny boppers just – flocked to them and just killed the vibe. Took over. So, yeah. Yeah. yeah, they took over. So it's in the turn, you know, the turncoats and the success chasing. Um, I, I, I pretty much followed football because my dad was really into it. So he, I think, was uh, travelled around a little bit, but he just loved football. So even then he was coaching, I think, at um, – so he was a teacher as well, coaching at, I think it was like East Brisbane. And uh, I'm trying to think it was a, an old Col- Carlton great that he actually coached as well. Um, back in his Very sort of nice. time at, at schooling. So that's how I kind of got into it. Went for the Bears, went to the games. Then the changeover happened. I was still quite young when the changeover happened, so I didn't really realize what was going on. Um, and then, yeah, got into football that way. But for me, similar to you, I actually played um, a year early. So I think I was playing a year up all the way from – so I played um, under eights a year early, and then pretty much I was already at the level. So then you kind of – I went to under tens early. Under 12s, you know, won a premiership and under 12s, played under 16s, some uh, under 18s. And then same thing, life kind of happened. And then when I left and then you start working and doing PT and all the rest of it, it was um, working morning and night. You don't really have time for training and other things because I'm kind of working outside of the normal nine to five hours. So that's sort of where it went. I went with more, your, you know, your golfs and your squash or something you can kind of organize that's, you know, not uh, routinely Outside of work hours, you can just go and have a hit yeah, during the middle yeah. of the day. You can go over here at this time and just kind of organize it that way. But um, yeah, I was I was fairly decent, but um, one of those kids that just wanted to play everything and everything. Um, touch, uh, I played. Uh, I played uh, representative AFL touch and cricket. Oh, and then, very nice, mate. But because I was just wanting to play everything, I didn't really isolate and focus on one specific sport. You kind of I had some tryouts for like Murray Bush Rangers and stuff up here, but then I was here and there and everywhere. So, um, but just love sport in general, to be honest. And I was that kind of annoying person in the preseason that would be just absolutely just trying to flog these sprints and stuff like that, you know, when you're doing laps or whatever in the preseason trainings and all these old heads are looking at me going, you're a toss. Like, you know, just trying to just running these laps around these cones in circles, just like, let's go, let's go. Um, kind of like a little energizer bunny that just didn't know any better, you know, um, but um, yeah, so for me, the the biggest part, and there's a couple of things that really resonate with me. Now, my my biggest footballer though, and it's really weird, was Jason Dunstall. Oh, uh, Hawks, very just, good. Just dominating goal kicker. Um, I remember. So probably Dad was like, "No, you cannot wear those colours." But I remember going onto the Gabba once as a kid, and it was uh, I think we were playing the Hawks, and I went on halftime show as a little young, yeah, you know, under ten or whatever it is, the little whippersnippers that go out halftime show. And um, I put on the Hawks gear because we were oh, playing nice. Hawthorne. And, we yeah, so he said, I'm running around. I was like, oh, I'm Jason Dunstall. Um, but he was like my favorite player just because he was just so dominant at the time where you're just watching this footage and just everything he had, he just clunked it, kicked it, just nailed everything. I'm like, wow, this guy is really impressive. And I don't even know how I got to that how I got to that position. Um, but I remember my major um, favorites after that point were probably Voss and Simon Black when you kind of get a little bit older. And Vossi and Black were just dominating everything where they'll kind of, you know, the, the brute physicality supplied with the class. And I quite liked that. And I was a little bit more one of those teenagers. I was a little bit more between the lines. It wasn't like an Akamanis type where I was just like, oh, let's just <laughs> everything out the window. Um, so, yeah, Blackie and um, and Voss were kind of like the, you know, the hard workers, the, the brute force, the class, the, go- the, the do-gooders. And I think that's probably why they resonate with me a little bit because I was a little bit more um, I think it was when I turned about 18, I was like, oh, what, you can actually do other stuff? Like, you know, I was just <laughs> just playing I was playing sports six, seven days of the week between the three sports. You kind of don't even look up. You're just too busy having fun, playing different True. things. True. Um, so I was, yeah, probably a little bit sheltered in the fact that I just loved sport. And then my, my love for footy kind of blossomed just from watching games and just enjoying football. But then it has really increased, I think, with Supercoach. Now – 
The reason I love the game a little bit more is because you kind of don't realize some of these up and comers, the, the new rookies, as in depth or intently. But when you're doing draft leagues and you're doing keeper leagues and you're doing uh, super coach or fantasy or you know the salary format, you actually are looking who's coming up and then you're noticing the good games they're playing, the good skills that they have. And you're like, wow, that's impressive. And then you kind of track them for a few years. And you're like, so when you see a sarong just start popping off with some big scores on 120s, it's not surprising. You know, or a Goulden, because I remember Goulden coming in and scoring what a 117 super coach's first game, and everyone's like, What the hell? Why is this guy on yeah, my bench? Yeah, Get on the yeah, field. Had him on the bench. <laughs> yeah, right. So but they're the things that you would never notice if you don't actually invest in the whole kind of culture of AFL. Now, I nearly moved to Melbourne, believe it or not. Um, a transition oh. period after a long term relationship. I was probably uh, I'd say about twenty three and loved football relationship broke down here and i was looking at a transition into some different work etc and i was like there's nothing really tying me here and i love melbourne and the reason i nearly moved and it's as simple as my sister was down there she lived uh, i think it was like sale now lives in like mafra but i went and visited hung out there for a few weeks and the thing that blew me away the most and it still sits with me is that i would hop on a train from sale Whatever I don't know if Sal has a train station, but it's in from Salish, right, or from yeah, Mafra yeah. or whatever, or Taralgon, um, and then going into the city. And there were people on this train for two hours just to see a football game. So that's two hours one way, and then two hours in return. And so me in Brisbane, you it's more you're more likely to find a rugby league supporter. I think that's why Chris and I got along really well because I'm like, hey, an AFL supporter up in Brisbane, <laughs> how great is this, right? Uh, even though we went for Collingwood, that's how slim pickings they are. Yeah, I just well, took any football supporter yeah, I could find, and he picky. was my friend. He was my friend. <laughs> um, but that's what blew me away. I was like, man, people are traveling two hours, and the train was just packed of people. And I was like, this is amazing. And I hop in the cab, and even the cab driver's like, oh, so what team are you going for? I had to be careful not to put an accent on then. <laughs> um, yeah. But what, what, yeah, you know, what team are you going for? Right. So it's just. Everywhere you go, it's really everyone just embodies it. Um, when you meet people from Victoria, the first thing you're like, "Hey, like, who do you follow?" And more often than Absolutely. not, they'll tell you a team. Yeah. Um, so I nearly moved down to Victoria when I was 23, so about 15 years ago. Well, shows uh, your your passion for the game, mate. Thinking of moving state for it, but and that's again going back to to the Fitzroy situation. That's one thing that killed me was the fact that. Although, you know, great situation with Brisbane, not being able to see your team play basically every second week, if you look at an even home and away schedule, that was that was very, very tough for me. And one thing, just before we move on, mate, you, you mentioned Jason Dunstall there about running onto the ground. Uh, I reckon I might have been, oh, no, maybe seven years, maybe, maybe around the seven-year-old mark. And I actually got to play on the MCG through Vic Kick back in the day. And it was a game where it was Hawthorne versus Richmond. The great Jason Dunstall kicked... I think it was Lazy 17 that day. So I remember just sitting there with Dad, who was a Hawthorne supporter, and my mouth was just, just, jaw was just wide open going, look at this man just absolutely dominate. So, yeah, can certainly feel you, mate, when you're talking about how amazing that bloke was to watch and just even accuracy on goal. Mad. Can I tell you that um, for many years you didn't miss many games up here? <laughs> I can tell you, <laughs> I I nearly went to Melbourne just to watch a good game of football. Like uh, all we got up in Brisbane, and then I'm like, well, each game was a flogging. It was poor, and I was just like, man, I just need to go to Victoria just so I can watch a good game of football. <laughs> and it was horrible for a long time, hey. And, and even then, shout out to any you know Lions member, um, yeah, that's actually sort of stuck at thin and kind of you know you still go. I think one time, and this shows how, I guess, not seriously take the game sometimes, but I think we played Port Adelaide, and I was like, right, here we come. We're going to get flogged. So I think I put money on the Lions to lose by 100 points or something. Like, yeah, with mates. I'm like, oh, stop it. Who cares? 100-point loss to Port Adelaide at home, whatever. And then the Lions turned around and won. I was just like, oh, what's going on here? And then the next game we're in the in the Gabba member section, and my mates are just like, have you put a bet on? I was like, no, what are you talking about? Like, you have to put a bet on for 100-plus on the other team. Um so it kind of became this oh, little running joke like because we, yeah. yeah, 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 you know, kind of coming in here, you know, not glass half full, but more like glass negative, um, you know, <laughs> you owe 500 mils. And, Just um, hedging your bets. You know, if you win, you're happy. If not, then hopefully a bit of money, extra money in the pocket, mate. Everyone's a winner. But you're right. There were some dull days, wasn't there, up there at the Gabba, some very, very dull days. But 
pretty exciting now, mate. I think we, we've got it together, and I think we're, we're looking all right at the moment, buddy. All right. What are, when you can let's try and round out maybe five things that you're looking forward to for this season. So it could be super coach, it could be teams or lineups, it could be anything. It could be you know round one when you have yeah you know, someone playing a former teammate. Like what are you looking forward to the most this year? Do you think? Look for me, mate. I'm hopefully looking forward to Brisbane making the grand final again. From a Brisbane point of view, there's probably three blokes that I'm really looking to to break out and take the next step this year. And I think if they can, we'll go a long way to us having some success in, in September. The first bloke's Cam Rayner. Now, I don't want to put pressure on the young man, but we know that he had that knee. We know that he was an early draft pick. It takes a little bit of time just to get your confidence back in your body, I think, after that. But I think if he can take that next step, I think spend a little bit of extra time in the midfield. I don't think anyone else in our team possesses that that burst and that initial power that, that someone like Arena does. So I'm really He's looking forward. He's a pit bull. He's Isn't an he? absolute pit bull. I don't Isn't know if you're – there's, there's two moments. One of them was I think uh, someone was going down the sideline and Rainer just came crashing through like an absolute wrecking car and just smashed him. And then the other one I think it kind of – almost like the ball went for a contest, pops up in the air, and then by the, to- by the time the ball gets there, he just takes about four or five explosive steps and just just bang, just absolutely smash He's someone. amazing amazing mate and lots of people um you know view him more as that forward type and i think i don't know what the mix is going to be i I certainly think it's going to be more of a forward midfield mixer absolutely but i just think if he's got the ability to run through there in times of need or if he's having a quiet game forward like all forwards can just get him involved he's a bit of a confidence type player we've seen the old shush i love that mate i love that from cam but look I, I think if he can take the next step that'll go a long way another bloke that i'd love to see a little bit more consistency with and i think it's tough when we're looking at his role is zach the rat bailey i love this fella yeah. mate we've seen him win games after the siren have his bags of three or four he can just dominate and be a real game changer but what i'd love to see is maybe those quieter games where he's getting your nine, 10 possessions, just maybe get that up to maybe the 13, 14 mark, at least I think. And maybe when he's not having an impact on the attacking front, maybe work on that defensive side of his game a little bit, but super tight player there, mate. And the other one I think a lot of people are excited about, even non mines fans, is Kitty Coleman this year, mate. So my boy, Dan Rich, very, very sad. What a servant of the club. We talked about when times were bad at the Gabba. This was one bloke, mate, that always gave his best. Very, very loyal when he could have easily gone back to WA. But we're looking for – well, I don't think anyone will ever replace Daniel Rich, but I think that someone like a Kitty Coleman is a bloke that can really step into those shoes, mate. We know he's what he did in the finals, elite-type player. I think he's had time to grow, work on his fitness as well. And I think best of all, um, and hearing you know from his own words in, in interviews during the year, he feels like he belongs now. I think there was a – point in time or a long point in time where he was questioning did he actually fit in the team was he up to the level but I think now it's clear that he's up to the level and they're relying on him to be one of the leaders of the team now I think and one of the real generals down back so from a Brisbane point of view looking forward to those three in particular and also the fact that I don't know what the exact timeline is mate but mid-season uh Ashcroft returning as well as Tom Duday I think this bloke is a terrific pickup. This he flew under the radar in the preseason regards to pickups. I think, mate, we know that we signed Izzy Gardner. I think it was for around three, four years from memory. Um, just as that, that probably more backup now. To be quite honest, I think. And when Duday hits his hits his straps and full fitness, he'll give us something else. I think that we need in that back line as well. Maybe something that I know he's not as strong as um, Marcus Adams, but that extra interceptor type, I think he's an elite player. He's a great leader as well. So having those two to return to the side, as well as the emergence of hopefully the Pepsi Max King and your Jasper Fletcher types, I'm bloody excited about this year, mate. And, uh, you know, even Josh Dunkley, it's his second year at the club. You may take a year to adjust. Hopefully we'll see the best out of this man as well. So, Really, really excited from from a Brisbane point of view. But with Supercoach, mate, I think already that the great thing is is meeting a few new content creators and, and meeting some new people. I, I love the networking side of things, mate. And uh, we'll be doing some team previews, obviously crossing over between different channels. So really looking forward to that. And the other thing in, in regards to Supercoach is what strategy are people going to, to go with? Are you going to get really funky and look to do an early buy flip? Are you going to really focus on the fixture? Is that going to be really how you select your premiums? 
how are you going to go about it? This is the big thing. Is it guns and rookies? Is it more fantasy approach now that we've got the 40 trades? So I'm just really interested to see how people are going to go and particularly what on earth we're going to do in our forward line, mate, because that's been the most dire it's been probably ever. Oh, you, you think it's bad? Wait until you get into draft leagues. Oh, any draft league that has 16 teams, like you are in for a bad time. I don't know how to how to put it nicely. Um, but you, you did speak about if, if the Lions didn't have the buy in round two, like uh, Dunkley I think is another one, true value. Um, people will probably be yeah. turned off by those that used to be a forward mid, you know, Taranto, Dunkley. Um, the only one that's probably bucking that trend is Butters at the moment based on the upside. They're kind of like a, a hit and hope almost in that it's his turn and he's definitely talented. But, you know, Goulden, all these players are kind of going under the radar because they did lose that forward status. So it, yeah, it reminds me of McRae in years gone by. McRae averaged 107 point something. No one wanted to touch him in draft leagues. Next minute average 120. So I think there is a, definitely a lot of um, room to go for that. I also think Hipwood's probably killed a lot of the uh, contracts at Brisbane now. They're only giving out three to four years <laughs> because um, yeah. of the old hippie. And um, I do think Reno is definitely a force to be reckoned with. If only we could fix his tendency sometimes to lean back, I think, when he kicks. It kind of then, that's you know, when you lean point. back, uh, that, that's why we, in our opinion, that's when he tends to not kick as well. He's such a strong, powerful guy that when he kicks through it and he keeps his body over the ball, it's almost like, you know, sometimes when you lean back, then your angles can kind of change a little bit, and that's when he tends to sort of spray the shots. Yeah. Um, but with Zach Bailey as well, the thing that um, I find, and I think he's an absolute talent, but you did say if it's not your day, right, try and pick up a, a three or four more, put on a few more shepherds, try and block for someone that's getting tagged. I think the key message for this one is if it's not your day, try and bring others with you in a positive yeah. sense. Yeah. So as in if you're, you know, and there's a, a – Olympic swimmer. So he was the Commonwealth Games medalist. Uh, spoke with him once, Cassiel. He's a diver. And he was saying, you know, the highs and lows of emotion and, and how you're feeling. But when he trains, he goes, I always give 100%. When he trains, he's in. But what that means is if I've only got 50% in my tank, then I'm tapping that tank out for today. So it's not about I have to do the peak performance and I have to reach, reach a full tank and I have to give a full tank every single day. It's saying, hey, today I've got a half a tank, but you know what? I'm going to spend it. Whatever I've got. Yep. So just recognizing yep. that you're giving 100% even if you don't actually have that 100 to give. And if you're not feeling it, try and bring other people with you because I think you'll find, and I do a little something as far as the gratitude that we spoke about. Sometimes, as you probably know, staff rooms can get a bit, how do you do certain <laughs> times of the year? Uh, but people just start to be internalized, focusing on themselves. And sometimes there is a little bit of that negativity or stress kind of creeping in. And sometimes I'm just not feeling it. And then I'm, I, a couple of times I'm like, right, I've just went and bought a big like fish on fire platter or whatever for like the staff room. And I'm just like, right, have at it. Or buy if there's something on sale because, you know, if it's free, it's me, that's best. Or if it's on sale, then I'll take that too. Um, Absolutely. But, you know, buying a block of chocolate or something and putting on desks of people or just something. Because if I'm not feeling it, then I know if I kind of try and bring others and boost them up, then I kind of feel a little bit better that I've almost tried to improve others or tried to lift the environment around me. Because I'm like, if I'm not feeling it, then they're probably not feeling it. And I probably can't change my mindset so easily, but I can try and influence others. And then I leave and it makes me feel better kind of doing something or trying to bring someone along to boost the morale or boost the positivity by being selfless or generous, not, not asking for kickbacks, right? Um, you know, just trying to do something or look for an opportunity to say hi or just something that kind of i think when you connect with people it's more fulfilling so if you're struggling then try and connect bring other people with you say hi how are you going help them with something or if it looks like everything's the, the, something sucking the life out of your work or something then do something funny like leave a little post-it or something obviously you know not uh, hr related but you know do something <laughs> like just you know something just bring people along because everyone's got stuff you know, everyone's got stuff they're dealing with. And if you feel that negative energy and that negative vibe, then there is something you can do to be said about just changing it. And it's something as simple. Everyone then looks at it going, you know what? I actually needed this. I wasn't really feeling it today. I said, yeah, I wasn't feeling it. But if I'm not feeling it, you kind of, I wanted to do something for you. So little things mate, can go a big way. Yep. Yeah. So bring people with you is probably the, the biggest thing I'll say. Um, for yeah. me, the biggest outside of, um, McRae and Jackson, et cetera, being probably the only forward in Supercoach. Um, 
The thing I'm looking forward to the most is um, all the buys. No, um, <laughs> so um, <laughs> what for punishment, uh, mate? <laughs> oh, I think there's eight buys out of twenty four or something or other. Um, yeah. I I am interested to see who's stepping up. So there is. Um, and I know we kind of, it's an easy target sometimes to, you know, North Melbourne, West Coast and these others, but I genuinely believe, you know, North have got quite a few people in the door now and it might take them another year or two years, kind of like the Lions to sort of build up. But I'm interested to see who steps up this year. And it's, you can't take it for granted. You can't just rest on your laurels and say, I've been there before, you know, it's going to happen again. You can't take things for granted. Um, yeah, same in life. You just got to keep keep at it. You just got to keep hustling, whatever you're doing. Um, I know PT once I was working and I lost, I think, 10 clients in a week, $500 a week, and this was you know, 10 years or so ago. Yeah, someone broke their leg, someone lost their job, someone moved state. And all of a sudden I was like, eh, and there's $500. Just cause, and you think everything's fine. You think you, oh, everything's all fine and you're complacent. But I'm interested to see, yeah, will Adelaide step up? Uh, obviously, Carlton mm. fans will tell you that Carlton's going top four, but yeah, you know, I'd be interested to see. In. Yeah, <laughs> interested to see how how they how they back it up. Uh, I'm really interested to see how you know St Kilda did they just play that style because of the injuries and try to go around the wing and use speed, or are they going to now change their dynamic that they've actually you know got some different mixes? Essendon as well, key defender there, Gresham coming in. You know, yeah. who yeah. I'm inter- I'm really interested. I think it's a very close competition. I hope it makes for interesting games. But I'm really interested to see on those fringe kind of, you know, you're looking at the, what, 6th to 12th, 10 to 12th. I think they're very much interchangeable. And it's it's going to be interesting to see who stands up because someone does most years. Yeah, yeah. And the, the Suns are another one. Is it going to be their year this year? You know, Dimmer's there for the first year. We look at the blokes like Anderson, et cetera. They should be at the right age now to be, to be really pushing. I think so. They're a really, really big watch for me, and it can be the first. Can it be the first time in history that we have two Queensland teams finish in the top eight? There's, there's so many, right, mate? It's very rare that well, I don't think it's ever happened before that 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 eight stays like it did the year before. There's always going to be teams going in and coming out. So uh, I'm with you, mate. Very exciting to see which teams take that next step and what they actually do, what they actually put in place to be able to actually take that next step as well, mate. The strategy side, I, I absolutely love. Yeah, I'm really keen to see what Gold Coast bring um, bring forward as well. So uh, shout out to Fish as well. Obviously covers um, so yes, Michael covering the covering Brisbane and the Suns. Um, so really love all of his input as well. So I'm, I'm intrigued what they're going to do with Tuke Miller this year. Uh, yeah. Obviously started, started as a tagger, moved into a pure ball-winning mid, dominated, but then you have, you know, Raul Anderson, Flanders kind of pushing up into the contest. Are they going to keep Flanders starting forward and pushing up as the extra mid? What are they going to do sort of with that dynamic? I think, is it Walter, the new draftee? I think he's an absolute pit bull. Yeah. Is, he is He is the biggest, I reckon, um, what is it, like a fridge with legs? Yeah. <laughs> if if he's that a fridge, had, yeah. fridge had, had a motor because <laughs> I don't think I've ever seen someone that heavy, that big as a key forward actually just mow someone down with the desire to tackle. Exciting Just, stuff, yeah, yeah. So that that's really exciting for me. Um, and Gold Coast, kind of like how you said the you know the old second wife kind of what I said second wife scenario. Uh, Gold Coast <laughs> is similar to that with me because you know they are kind of just you know not too far away. It's probably about 45, 50 minutes drive to their stadium, and um, yeah, they did originate while I'm up here, so I do have a soft spot for the Suns, just not when we're playing them. So yeah, absolutely, mate. Not with the Q clash. <laughs> Definitely not with the Q clash. And, um, you know, I'll be sure I'll be channeling my inner Zorko and just kind of throwing <laughs> elbows out. Pressure point, pressure point. Oh, that's his eye. Oh, sorry, Zorko. Um, and I do, I do love the Zorko. I actually have a, a poster of him before all the um, the petty stuff and that went down. Um, so I've still got a stuff all signed of him and he was really nice. So I don't know if, Anyone's ever heard this story, but my partner, I got permanency. My partner wanted to reach out because Zorka is obviously one of my favorite players and uh, reached out to him on social media and he made the time for me. He, We went into the Lions Den to the, the shop at the Gabba um, and then he made a time, met up with me, shook my hand, signed anything that I bought from the Lions shop, had a photo, 
and gave up his time. So I mean, Unreal. I know it's I know I know he's a bit of a you know sometimes it rubs people the wrong way, and he does play with a certain gray area of um, morale as you know as a player. <laughs> but but you know I mean like there are things that you don't really hear of. You know, when you're competitive, though, sometimes those competitive lines do get blurred. Sometimes people do things that they may or may sure. not do if they weren't on a battlefield. Because um, if you're out there for battle, sometimes you're going, well, it's me against you. It's my crew against your crew. And if it's not quite life or death, obviously, but sometimes in that competitive spirit, sometimes you're right. The, the lines get blurred and people stuff up and, you know, get suspended or whatever have you. So, oh, absolutely, suspensions. Mate. Do you reckon they pack it in a little bit more this year or is every tackle going to get suspended for three weeks again, like Sicily? Do you reckon they tone it down or ramp it up? I, I, I hope so, mate. I, I hope so. Look, I think that for most of the general public, the feedback would be that they do need to tone it down a little bit. I think hopefully we can come to that happy medium. Players are pretty adaptable. I think we know that there's, I think it was, um, was it Dacos and Murphy I saw the other day, Dacos tackle Murphy who's had, previous concussion issues. And I think it was a bit of a dump tackle. And someone did mention that if that was actually in game, he may be looking at a week or two there. So it just does goes to, goes to show at the same time that uh, accidents can yeah. happen. But I think the players have learned to adapt a little bit more. You're always going to get those unlucky cases. But, you know, what do they do? They want to stamp out the concussion. But I think you've got to be realistic. But there's no rule for what's realistic. It's what I think, what you think may be a little bit different. Yeah. So... I don't It'd be hard at training too, I think, as far as, you know, it's a teammate too, so you don't really want to hurt the teammate. Um, yeah. Someone actually posed the exact same question to me, I think it was on Twitter or on um, just through general conversations. You know, oh, if this was in a game, it'd be three weeks. So I said, yeah, but what you fail to realize is on the other side of that, Josh Dacos had his hand on him, so no suspension. <laughs> I don't know if you remember <laughs> the one how he got rubbed off because his brother kind of contributed to the tackle. That's right, um, that's right. Yeah, I was like, you can't see, but just on the other side of Murphy there, Josh Dacos. Um, and he'll he'll write a, a swear testimony to that, that he was there in the vicinity. Um, but obviously we just, we ingest it. But, yeah, we don't want anyone to have those concussions, let alone, you know, the, the, the big ones, though. Like concussions, you go and accept, okay, it's a part of our game, it's a part of football. It sucks, you know, no one wants it. But then on the flip side, it's a double-edged sword. If it's too much or too consistent or too often, then that's the sort of like, you know, no one wants to see that. So you can't say, oh, hey, by the way, it's in the game and just deal with it. But then also, oh, sorry, your your career's ruined. Um, I remember, I can't remember who it was. It was a Brisbane Lions player. I think wanted to um, go to university or fly or something rather, end up retiring because he had Justin a concussion. Clark, I think he might that's be. That's right, Clark. Right? Yeah, so really, really, really smart man. Fella. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, and that's the, as well. yeah. And, um, but I can't imagine not knowing what day it is or not knowing all these things because, yeah. you know, and us as supporters, it's, it's easy to go, Hey, I'm going to tune in for this two hours, 30 minutes. And then once that game's done you, the win, lose, draw, and you kind of deal with it. Whereas they have to deal with it for the week to try and then get up and get themselves right. So again, I think that last half fall is in just having the, I guess, optimism and empathy as well. To go, okay, well, like it is part of the game, but then if there are health benefits or health concerns, should I say, that come from it, then just that's not the kind of side that we want to see. Because I can't imagine, imagine, well, you know, we both have kids, families. Imagine, imagine the kids and you don't know their names, you don't recognize who oh, they are, you have headaches yeah. all day, you'd just be a space cadet. And, um, you know, so I think it's, it is something that I think the more research, like smoking, like, obviously, that's a horrible analogy as far as trying – I'm not comparing the two, but I'm saying that sometimes something is socially acceptable and then the more time comes, the more data, the more science, the more everything – the data is compiled to go and actually realize what it is doing to your body and how it can actually yeah. impact your health. Yeah. That yeah. was what I was kind of getting at. Yeah. Um, so I think over time it will sort of come out. So it'll be really interesting to see what comes from it. Absolutely, mate. Yeah, and you've got to remember as well that uh, these AFL stars and heroes of ours – are uh, sons and brothers and husbands and, and people as well at the end of the day. So uh, even like you look at like a Marcus Adams who's recently had to retire, that was – and when I watched the incident, mate, not not to get sidetracked, but it seemed so minor to me. But, yeah, unfortunately the man's career is over now. But I know Chris Fagan got super emotional when uh, he oh. made his giving away 
give, uh, going away speech. And it really did did pull my heartstrings a little bit because uh, more than anything, as I just said, you know, he, he's a person and, you know, it kills him to have to give up his dream of continuing to play AFL football. But really glad that he, he put his health first. And, uh, yeah, they're the, the things that we need to look after the most majors here, obviously our health. But yeah, yeah, I tell you what, that was that was a tough one to watch oh, actually. Oh Marcus. Even Adam. Paddy McCartan's one. I mean I think there was about yeah. one or two where everyone you kind of cringe and turns out, oh he's not concussed or he was, but he's feeling good. And then it was the most innocuous one that, you know, was really bad. Yeah, um, unreal. And sometimes and then you watch it back going, oh like how like how? But then at the same time you're like, that's yeah, just yeah, concerning. So um but yeah, just well, at this point of the show, mate, it's an hour. And if you're still here, then people are just enjoying whatever. If you don't apologize for going on a tangent, this is the fun time, mate. Just dive <laughs> yeah. in. Whatever you're doing, we've gone through the fun stuff. This is where you can just shine a light on anything you want. And you say, hey, if you've lasted an hour and you're listening to this, then good on you. You can have Absolutely. whatever biscuits I'm putting down. <laughs> no, but it's, it's been awesome because as we said, there was no script or no structure to this. We've literally sent a couple of PMs. What do you reckon, mate? Bang. Let's just hit record and, and see yep. what happens. So, look, obviously, as time goes on, mate, if it gets a bit of traction, we'll obviously get a little get a little bit more organised, mate, and have a little bit more structure yeah, for sure. to what we go through. But we were just both, I know, super keen, mate, just to go, bang, let's have a chat. Let's get it out there because I know that that's how our, our podcast came about. And I think you mentioned something similar before with yeah, you yeah. and Chris, like with me and Spills, is that you just talk with mates about the game, about about life. And, it, you know, a phone conversation with Spills and I, for example, or Janet and I, is never just about super coach. Life always gets involved in there somehow. But that's the best thing about it. We thought, well, why not just put this in a podcast rather than just talking to each other on the phone all the time, put it out there, hit record, and just share our thoughts with everyone. So uh, something a little bit different, mate, um, getting, trying to get, obviously, in the positive side of things, try to help a few people out. But again, talk about and bring up our passion of football. That's what really is tying us together as well as our families and hobbies. But as you said, mate, very much, you know, opposites. You know, you said when you got to 18 that, uh, you know, very much in your sport, in the books as well. I love my sport as well, but I uh, did find myself in a little bit of mischief from time to time, Benny. So uh, there'd be a few people, in you know, that I grew up with maybe from the 16 to 18 mark that go, gee, this bloke's a teacher in, in charge of our next generation, in charge of the youth. We're in deep trouble. So, uh, but look, we grew up. We were oh, sure, don't mate. worry. I was, I was very <laughs> selfish between twenty to thirty. I think, mate. So don't stress too much. Um, well, maybe not quite thirty, but you know, you kind of go through that self-discovering sort of area. Um, yeah, spills same thing. I think um, first time I met him, very, very um, well-known public story. You probably have heard. Um, that was in the toilet. The, mate, the yeah, yeah, correct. Yeah, yeah. So. Uh, <laughs> Well, this is where we're just recording. I think put it out on Twitter saying, "Hey, we're going down to Metricon because I heard all this stuff about Raul and Anderson, and mainly Raul." And I was like, "Right." And Chris is telling me, "No, nah, no, nah, you're not paying that much for this guy, etc., cetera, etc." Cetera. And like, "No, nah, you know, don't do it." And I convinced <laughs> the uh, um, this is before kids, so I convinced um, yeah, Katrina, my partner, to go to the beach and then go to the football after the beach. So it worked out really well. Had a couple beers at the beach. Uh, sorry, a couple beers at the game. Got to watch them, and Raul and Anderson were just phenomenal, like oh, absolute. Nice, nice. Yeah, and like Raul was a pit bull, and then Anderson, I think, I, I remember one, someone tried to smother him, and he pretty much kicked it underneath someone's arm and then laced out someone on the run about 40 metres away. And I, from that, I was just like, this guy is ridiculously good. <laughs> and um, from from that point on, but yeah, I met, so Spills, um, shout out to Spills, and I keep telling him all the time, but. Yeah, I was like, "Hey, is anyone going to the football game, etc.?" And then here I am in the in the urinal, washing off the beers, <laughs> and um, yeah, the irrigation station, as I call it. And uh, and then all of a sudden, here is Super Kitchen Soda. And um, but again, the love of footy, kind of, and I still talk about it. It's the most random place I've ever been spotted. Um, the only other because I'm in Brisbane, mate. No one ever notices me. I'm in Brisbane. No one spots you. You kind of just. It's. I almost feel like Joe Danaher. Not that I'm actually a big deal, but he moved up here because no one recognizes you. I've only ever been recognized twice. One was Spills and the other one was a, a guy. And I was like, oh, holy crap, I was at the Gabba. And then it turns out he's from, no, he's from Adelaide. He just came to watch Port Adelaide get thumped by the Lions at the Gabba. So well, there you go. Um, Not shout, even out, shout out to that guy. <laughs> so, you know, but the the biggest thing for this this part of it, if we do get some guest speakers, it'll be a case of sending some questions to them to give them a heads up saying, hey, this is what we want to talk about. Whereas today, we, the best part about going off cuff a little bit is having some basic structure is it's more genuine. 
like we can dive into any part of the conversation, the stories that we share, the conversations we have and how we kind of go to and fro, like to and fro. It's genuine. And you can't have scripted and fully structured conversations that are genuine. If you're too busy trying to toe the line on every single agenda, it just, I think it comes across not the same way, which is why Absolutely. when you, I think with your, with your energy and the way that we vibe through the lines, a um, couple of educators, really great communicators. Um, that's it. <laughs> so, you know, I think it's, that's why when I thought of it, I was just like, when I put it out there, this is a guy who I think could bring some positivity and also articulate, you know, on the elements within. So, yeah, happy to have you. I Glad you got that, on. Mate. And, 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 and like you um, as well, mate, because you've, you've made, managed to open up as well, talk about a couple of dark times that you have. You haven't had to go into great detail, but... I think it, it just goes to show because, so you know, a lot of the time, right, when we do these videos, particularly as content creators, we might have had a bit of a shitty day, but you don't want to jump on the camera or whatever and be all shit. You want to be positive, mate. You want to be positive. But, it, it, you know, and some people may think, geez, Ryan, Benny, Chris, Swizz, all these guys, they're always happy. Geez, they must have it bloody easy with what they do. But a lot of the time you do put the smile on because you don't want to be a negative Nelly when you're doing these sort of podcasts and, and, and these videos, mate. But I think just seeing that the human side of you, mate, um, has been really, really good for people, really good for me as well, because, you know, we've chatted a fair bit among the years, yeah, mainly yeah. Super Coach, but to talk to other people about life and their background and some of their struggles and, you know, ways that they've almost got out of a few dark holes has been awesome, mate. And I think uh, another thing we really want to achieve is just to be relatable to other people out there because uh, everyone goes through struggles, Everyone loves their footy, or most people, I think, that are tuning into this probably love their footy. So although you and I are different in some ways, mate, we've got lots of similarities, and I think that'll be the same with the community that we'll, we'll build here, mate. So yep. uh, absolutely wrap, mate, for our first one. And uh, can't uh, no, wait to, I, to keep this pumping, legend. I just talk like no one's listening, to be honest. Like that it's just me and a computer <laughs> screen. Um, and it's hard to think sometimes of the reach that you kind of have. I don't know about you, but sometimes, you know, even if you don't record for a week, sometimes you get these messages like, Hey, when are you guys recording What's going um, on, or man? really like, <laughs> yeah, really like that episode or, you know, like Anders and a few others talking about my whiskey collection and a few things like, Oh, Hey, <laughs> I'd watch a show just on that. Um, but when it's just you on a computer screen, I think that's why it's probably easy for me to share. Like in person, if I was face to face, I'd probably have more of a hard time with that because you know, I, it's, I, I'm hope, fine with opening up, and then it's just that harder bridge because it's not. I'm not the type of person to be like, oh, hey, by the way, I've got, I've had this, this, and this. Whereas yeah, on this platform, yeah. I'm quite comfortable talking about myself, all the struggles, all the things that I've experienced. Because you know, when you get to you know 37, 38, you actually have had quite a lot of a journey to to discuss and unpack. Whereas when it's me and it's a computer screen, I can project my thoughts really well, and then if people buy something from it and take something from it, then yeah, awesome. But I don't feel the same way as in a talking face to face and making it hard for me to talk. So I don't know if, if you're someone that if you're someone that can't talk to someone face to face, then maybe write that message, write a letter, send a video, and um, whatever it may be like whether it's partner, whether it's family. Um, also, like negative energy man, is so hard to hold on to. You know, some people just whether it's spite, whether it's it's just I don't know like. I'm not the the person that kind of, you know, if you don't like me, then cool. If you resonate with me and you want to spend time with me, yeah. But also I have, I, I, I don't know about you, but I find it hard to spend time with probably my five best mates. And we've all got oh, families, we've all got yeah. stuff going on, everyone's got work. And, you know, it's it's not a personal thing, but when you're kind of trying to take care of your own house, you don't always have the most time. And I don't know how you've managed it because we're kind of, we're definitely getting a little bit off topic, but I, I found it hard to be selfish for the first, and my little girl's turning three next month, right? So for oh, pretty much three, good, for three years, I probably put the family ahead of me as far as my, you know, my partner when she was off work or when she was at work, I'd pretty much finish because school teachers do. We have great time. Like lifestyle-wise, I am extremely Absolutely. grateful yeah. that I can actually see my kids in the morning, go to work, and still see my kids and do the bath time, bedtime stuff at night, right? But then outside of that, I would often, my partner would need a break or do things. And then I would actually prioritize the family over myself. 
you know, she needs a break, so I'll come home, take the kids, give her a break to go do something, clear her head because kids are chaotic. You know, and I think this year I've now got to a point where, you know, I try actually being it's okay to be selfish. It's okay to make time for yourself. And, you know, I keep going back to the if you are fulfilled and you are happy and you are doing things for yourself, then you will then bring that home and you will be better in other aspects of your life. And it's probably taken me three years to kind of actually implement that a little bit more, you know, being selfish and it's okay to spend time for yourself and still take care of others. Oh, that, that, so, that's right, mate. And getting the balance is in anything that you do is tough, isn't it? But getting the balance in life, particularly when you've got the kids, you know, mine are what, 13, 11, I you know, said so about 14, 15 months at the moment. So a little bit of time in between drinks here, mate, but it's like riding a bike, you know, you haven't jumped on for a while, a little bit wobbly at the start, but you get pedaling, you're like, oh, that's right. But one, one, I'll tell you what, one difference very Are you talking quickly, about conception or the birth? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Benny, I've got to tell you this, mate. Talk about going way off topic. Oh, right? this just, is all right. <laughs> just while we're on this, right, this, this is a true story, right? So when I had my first fella, Nash, right, being a first-time dad, there's no instruction manual. You don't know what's going to happen with kids, different personalities, all the rest, but I had no idea what to expect, right? So we're in, we're in the hospital, right? Wife is right in the middle of labour, and all of a sudden I'm, I'm up, I'm up her end, you know, patting her head and all the rest. It's all right, darling. You know, we'll, we'll, we'll get through. I'm here with yes, squeezing her hand. She's swearing at me and cursing at me. Didn't take anything personally. I'd been warned about this type of stuff from mates that have had kids before, so everything was travelling all right. And then all of a sudden, mate, the uh, the nurse or the doctor comes up and goes, Ryan, come up, mate. You know, you know what to do now. And I thought, do I? Shit, I've, I've missed something here in the parenting classes. What on earth is going on here, right? Duck for cover, it's a grenade. <laughs> yeah, what is happening, right? Genuinely had no idea. So I go up the other end, let's just say the opposite end to the head. I had a look down and oh my goodness, mate. Um, I can't watch a movie with blood in it, with fake blood. I cannot oh. describe to you what this was like, oh. my friend. But anyway, you know. anyway, moving forward. The I've got a story on that coming out, right? And I'm watching all this, right, in um in 5D or 6D, whatever it is these days. And then the doctor says, right, you know what you do, guide him out, you know, guide him out. And I'm thinking, what on earth is happening here? So I'm going, why is the ghost about to pass out? Somehow managed to grab on with the help of the doctors, and he comes out, and the cord gets cut. And this is the biggest whirlwind in my life, mate. I'm thinking oh, I've missed the boat on something here. Long story short, a couple of hours later, the doctor comes in, another doctor, and says, we're so sorry, sir, but we've got your birth plan mixed up with the fellow next door. He's actually a medical student that uh, had had special permission <laughs> to deliver his own son. <laughs> and so somehow, mate, the oh, old clipboards no. had got swapped. And I, uh, oh. I apparently they thought that I was a medical student. Uh, so that's my right, quick birth the story time. there, mate. But Pretty cool Dude. story. Managed to deliver my own son, but the doctor did say, "Mate, we're a little bit concerned. Um, you're looking wider than your wife that was actually giving birth, having to stand there and do what you did, mate." So, there we go. That's oh. just a little random birth story for Dude. you, mate. No, um, no, 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 no. So, so make sure the things. second was the, right. The the first ones because I had no idea as well, and I'm there, <laughs> and everyone's saying like, "Oh, are you are you going to look?" And I was like, "I don't know. Like, why would I want to look?" You know. And next minute, I like caught a little glimpse, and I was just like, "Oh, it's like this. Yeah, you know, it's a little hair. It's like this little tiny." ball with his hair and i just thought oh wow th this head is really tiny i was like there's this little tiny thing with this little hair out there and then next one was like alien versus predator <laughs> and i was just like <laughs> i was just like whoa <laughs> i cannot take that back <laughs> i wasn't gonna look and I, thought, I, I honestly thought this is how tiny this little head was and then i was like no no way near Oh, Next level, that was mate, the first one, Next and then <laughs> we stayed in there for like five nights. And this one's really funny because um, one of the one of the um, midwives, or whatever, is like, "I'm going to write this down in my book. Um, help yourself to anything." We stayed there for five nights. There's a cupboard with all your you know your linen and your towels and your bed sheets. Help yourself. I was like, "Cool." So went and helped me help myself. Got some towels, sheets, and the rest of it. So I'm sleeping, and I was like, "Man, this is really weird." It's like this this sheet's got really glossy like one side and then it's got some you know buttons and stuff and i was like this is really weird pretty comfy and i was like that's just a bit strange i'm like didn't really think much of it anyway so two nights go by and i'm in the shower and i look up i'm like hang on i grabbed a shower a shower curtain <laughs> and the <a> sheet <laughs> and i've been sleeping underneath it it was like glossy on one side like fire retardant silky <laughs> on one side with holes in it to be hung up 
and I was using it as a bed sheet for two nights. <laughs> oh, classic, man. Whatever does oh, the job, said, mate. Help, you know? <laughs> yeah, they said help themselves. I had no idea. And um, the nurse thought it was absolutely hilarious. I was like, oh, my God, I feel so, like, embarrassed. I just <laughs> slept under a shower curtain for two nights as a bed sheet. Oh, I love that, mate. A little bit, little bit sticky on one side, but... You know, mate. That, that, oh, well, that was just a labour. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, we've, but, we've um... all got our own stories, don't we? I've got, I've got three now, and it's like the first one. You know, the the dummy goes on the floor. It's in the steriliser. Get a new one, type thing. The second one, it's like, oh, give it a quick wash. This one now, it's like, oh, well, he needs to build up an immunity to this and that. Chuck it back in the mouth. Yeah. You know, we'll be right, type thing. Yeah, yeah. So in the bathtub with charges. the other kids. Take care of him. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I remember copping a bit of flat because, again, like for me, life motto is if it's free, it's me. So as in if it's free, like if someone give, has free tickets or a free opportunity or even education, like something cheap, like a cheap opportunity to do something, if it's free, it's me. Because I think Absolutely, there's so many mate. valuable Smart, lessons you can have from a, you know cheap opportunity. So if someone's having, if it's free drinks or something, I'm like, yes, I will have those drinks. If it's free food, I'm like, yes, I will have that food. Diet be damned. If it's free, it's me. Um, <laughs> and... Um, so the funny part was, is that I'm just trying to think back. Um, what are we talking about? Quick, quick, quick. Oh, We're three... talking about kids, three kids. You, you, you've lost it, mate, have you? We're... I know, I've lost <laughs> it. Um, I'm just, I've, I've gone on an all-you-can-eat buffet and then I got so distracted. Like on... if mate, not, I was so excited. Else, we know that, mate. We've learned that. Was, and it tastes better if so it's free excited. as well, let me say. Oh, so that's what I was going to get to. I was so excited about the food that I completely started thinking about all the food I'd love to eat at a free food buffet that I lost track of thought. Um, well, I got a lot of flack because when you're in the maternity suite, so we're in private, you actually had they gave us like the code and you could have free drinks free food or whatever so i'm darking out while my, my while my partner's giving birth and in the suite i'm like getting a you know curry meal and heating up like a lean cuisine meal grabbing soft drinks and everything and she's there like are you kidding me i'm just there in the in the birthing suite just eating some food because it's free <laughs> just that kind of thing love so it, i love it you yeah, gotta take it it's, it's opportunity mate you know it's uh everything's expensive these days so if you can get a bargain, mate, I'll tell you what, little guilty pleasure of mine, just before, because I know that Hungry Jack's is about 10 minutes down the road from, from a work, get the old shake and win, mate. So you go up the top, shake and win. And if you don't get anything good, mate, it's all good. Shake it you twice. don't stop in at the way home. But if you get, you know, you're right, you get two chances. But if you get that It's nice like the food, urinal. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> they won't let you shake a ball at twice. <laughs> <laughs> two shake, little mate. Yeah, two I'll shakes. Tell you, Oh, get one of the, the, the cheeseburger and uh, shake meals for three bucks. I'm absolutely there, mate. So the, all you can do is win. You can't lose. You're not losing anything from the old shake and win, mate. So absolutely love that, mate. What I do before uh, I shouldn't – I hope my wife doesn't watch this because, uh, yeah, that may be a reason why I don't uh, arrive home hungry for the dinner at times, mate. But uh, you got to love a bargain, Benny. you got to love a bargain, mate. Nothing wrong with that at all, my friend. You do. I like shopping around on anything that's uh, on special. Um, but speaking of the monetary side of things, also we did mention earlier in the podcast, supporting other people and YouTubes, et cetera. Please do support them because I know a couple of my favorite podcasts gone by stopped. And it's a really, sometimes it's a lonely, so with podcasts, um, YouTube is good. Anytime you hit the thousand subs, so if you find someone that doesn't have a thousand subs and you like what they're doing, please do like, subscribe them because that's when you start to get a little bit of a kickback. It's not a huge amount, but obviously every video you put up, it just helps keep that momentum going and keeping you on the platform. So especially for podcasts as well. So if you don't support them, and I know it's hard because everyone's got things going on and monetary stuff and you know you have the Disney and your, your Foxtel and your, all the other platforms and your stand, everything wants your money, let alone you know all the social media and the, the you know, uh, Supercoach Gold and the Herald Sun and everything like that. But if you can support them, or even just like these things, YouTube, right? You just watch the YouTube. If you see an ad, just let it run for a little bit and then that you can support your favorite YouTube artists and then they will keep pro uh, producing content you love. Because without it, it's, you know, we ran at a loss, I think, for about four and a half years before and we just did it for the love of it, it's running at a loss. And then now at least we're at a point where we're making money and it's not about the money, but it's about just being able to at least recoup costs and give you some reward for time. So that way you can keep on doing the passion project that you are invested in and still stay connected to community. So 100%, yeah, support mate. everyone you can. 100%. And do you know what? The, the, there are so many, aren't there? You, you detested this. So many, I'm not going to say 
uh, all space, lesser known creators out there that are producing so many great videos out there. But with the algorithms, if they haven't had that much, ex much exposure before, it's really hard for people to actually find their videos. That's not because it's not top quality as well. There are some great content creators out there. And I'm actually planning on doing a video uh, pretty soon, actually, mate, to try to promote some of these guys. And uh, it's not something that any of these people have asked me to do. It's just, as you said, mate, it's to help out the community because the more ideas, opinions, that you get from some of these great people, the better. And uh, I know how much time and, and effort it does take into it, mate. As you said, with the cost, with different subscriptions that you've got to get and all the rest, but it's not about money for us. But uh, if you can support some smaller YouTubers, then yeah, it'd mean a yep. lot to both of us and uh, get get part of the community. By doing yep. that, you also include yourself and ingrain yourself in the community as well. Because when we talk about Supercoach community, we just don't mean content creators it is the viewers the people that make comments the people that tune in and you don't have to comment on every video you know but um watch what you like whatever you might not have right. time for every video yeah. but again it's yeah i i think we're similar as far as you know if people are going to watch different people some flavors like i know you know some people like you know dr Supercoach, um you know the old jock reynolds crew yeah sc elites like even like some of the old school that's the ones that i kind of grew up like listening audio side of things but it doesn't matter who you like, who you listen to. Everyone has different flavors, different takes. Find someone that resonates with you. Dabble around a little bit. Get some ideas. I've heard a few people saying like, oh, no, don't listen to too many people. They're going to collude your thoughts. I'm like, no, well, don't don't listen to premium per se. Like make your own mind up about specific people. But look at the strategy. What are they thinking of doing? What do they think the outcome of that will be? How are they going to mix up their money and their strategy and their time? You know, which you know, they're going to fade on a premium. What's their rationale for it? And then try and add everything up. So I think there's definitely more than enough love for so many people within this community. And 100%. listen to whoever floats your boat is all I can say. So, That's right. That's right. Different podcasts for different yep. folks as well. If you're looking at the entertainment side, there's some great stuff for that. The real analytical side. Uh, hopefully what we both can do, mate, is bring a bit of a balance. So have that analytical yeah, yeah. side and then have a laugh, have a joke, have some banter. That's what it's all about, Benny. So uh, it yeah, is. Mate, I tell you, looking forward to it. Looking forward to a bloody big season in 2024. Yep. And if you can't find someone that floats your boat, listen to the goat, which is Supercoach Dr. The oh, humble man who won't that. he won't say it himself, <laughs> but I've seen a few comments just say, "Oh, I thought you were talking about yourself." The goat master, mate. You have definitely every bit of love that you receive is well deserved, mate. And um. I think we only recorded once live properly, I think, before this point. And even just for that one session, I was just like, this is a guy that I could talk to and, you know what I mean, like on, on the line, as oh, they would likewise, say. Likewise, buddy. So, Absolutely right. likewise, mate. And uh, love what you guys are doing as well. And that's the thing with you, Chris, and Swizz as well, is that uh, – if, if people just tuned in for like five minutes at times, I think these three are the biggest of enemies that we've ever seen, right? But it's all <laughs> love. That's what I love about it. You guys can just shoot each other, other down so yeah. well. But it, it, it's all great discussion. And then, oh, listen, you might be saying something different to Chris, and then you go back to the different pins we were talking about before. It's like, oh, yeah, I agree with that, Benny. Shit, I agree with that too, Chris. Damn, where do I, where do I sit here? Yeah, but yeah. You make your own judgment. You, hear, you get all the info you can. Put it down on the table and go, right, where do I sit with this? You've always got to put a yep. bit of gut feel in it, mate, but nothing wrong with getting different opinions and different ideas out there. And that's a great thing about collabing with people as well is that you don't always have to agree, but sometimes when you don't agree on something, they're the best type discussions because you can tend to think a bit of a different way, mate. Yeah, and sometimes we're relentless. Like I know Swizz was big on homes as an option. I just tore shreds for weeks. Yeah, like yeah, it's not right. – yeah. like this is the worst <laughs> advice you've given anyone all year, like ever. <laughs> um, but, you know, and the, the thing I like about it, we're kind of more of the entertainment point of view, but we do analyze the games. And it's the, the same thing, the, the entertainment value, if you want to listen and get some super coach knowledge and advice, but also have some laughs, and that's the kind of take that we have. But um, the thing I think I like about it the most is that we do – each of us do our individual teams as well, and we do a week yeah, to week. As in, yeah. this is the, this is this is our team. This is what we're thinking. This is how we're shaking up, and we don't actually talk to each other about that. So some people might go, "Oh, my team's similar to yours," or "I like the way you think," and you can try to tune into each of us individually, um, and sort of go about it that way. But it is it is a good sort of scenario to have where we we get together, and the the different part is is you know we all we see the game differently. So as in, I'm very much a stats rationale 
you know, cost versus benefit sort of, I need the numbers to kind of stack up with a bit of gut feel. Chris sees the game differently. He sees the elements, you know, and everyone sees the game differently. So even then we're talking about strategy and he'll be like, oh yeah, so Collingwood actually, they kind of run down the center and then they, they literally hit a 90 degrees and then lead towards the boundary, like running 90 degree angles towards the boundary and getting hit ups. And I was like, that's uh, crazy. I didn't even think about it. Then you watch them live. I'm like, yeah, there they go. They're running these 90 degrees. And I was like, I hadn't seen that before. And then Dunkley comes to Brisbane and then Chris is talking about like, oh, well, there goes Lockie Neal because Dunkley runs the same lead up options, the short lead up options that Neal does, except Dunkley's taller. So Dunkley is going to be getting the short lead up hit options to move the ball up the ground. And next minute starts happening. Dunkley's tall and he's a, you know, so they see it all very differently. And then Swizz is just yep. an all round. He's just a, a goat that, yeah, I, I joke saying that if they played Supercoach Snail Racing, he'd be right in it. Or Cockroach Racing for Australia Day, he'd he, he, he'd he'd be top he'd be top thousand on whatever he plays. He just has a knack. Uh, wins, and it, wins and it's NBL some, Supercoach for a round as well. For like, a round, oh, like yeah. get out of it, Swizz. How can you do that, mate? But well done. Is isn't that good? And I've I've actually met up with Swizz. It was a I think it was Supercoach Brains Trust down there at the the pub, and with, with lots of different yep, yep. creators and. Yeah, Peter we, we hit and, straight um, away, mate, yep. and talked about life and, and all these trains and all that sort of stuff. Probably had a few too many sherbets by the end and um, stumbling around Fox Footy uh, around the back uh, offices and stuff there, which was fun. But, uh, yeah, and no, I really, really enjoy it, mate. And that's the thing about different personalities. You don't always be the same personality, dude. It's like Janet Spills and I. Janet is one of the smartest blokes that I've ever met in my life. Spills is just your laid back, key basic decisions a lot of the time on who he thinks is a better bloke. He doesn't worry about too much about the data, mate. So, you know, it's it's great to get different personalities out there. And in the content creating space, there are so many great and, and, and varied personalities, which which makes it even all the more fun. And I'll tell you what, mate, don't know if you're much of a poker player yourself, but I was speaking with yeah. uh, the old godfather. Um there's got to be a time, mate. We can even fly up there, mate. We might fly up to Queensland for this. We'll see. Or if you're in Vic next time, we want to organise a super coach poker game. Dude, a big, big I tournament. have, dude, I have a ten seater heavy duty poker table at mine. We're there downstairs. We're, we're there. So right? in, I'm driving before, up before before yep. the babies came. I bought a ten seater poker table, heavy duty, oh. like as in you can't carry one person can't carry it. It's bloody heavy. It's sturdy, and then. All yeah. the, and all the like all the clay chips as well with the dollar denominations on them. But uh, I I don't. Here's another story you don't know about. But I actually used to be a tournament director for poker. So one of my mates, Matt, uh, so through Supercoach, he he actually deals at a casino. I've never worked at a casino, but I used to run all the old APL poker tournaments and all the rest of it that used to no, kind of be around. Man. No. Yeah, man. I'm, yeah, I'm, so I'm that's APL, our, mate. I'm APL. Yeah, yeah. APL director. So, no yep. way. Are you ex tournament uh, director as well? I was in Bendigo, mate. I did it for what? two years for uni. I played for the first two years and then got to know him really well. Won the regional tournament based off all the you know the points and all the rest in those days, and then got the job. But the issue was that because I worked, I couldn't play. Was it the same rules for you as well? If you work, if you if you work, yeah, yeah. you're not allowed to play in the APL yeah, anymore. Correct. Yep. Yeah, I was, that was the only thing that was spewing, but. Used to have a cash game like almost every night back at back at yeah, our joint. Yeah. Always, the always, always. Oh, I can't believe that, man. There you go. Yeah, and then you have That's the table awesome. as well. So I'm like, oh, I've got the tables, and you just like roll yeah. the racket up, and then yeah, yeah, dude, that was so. Uh, look at this. Wow, look at this. If you yeah, lasted an hour and twenty eight minutes, mate, this is how well, we're now just really? vibing on poker right now, mate. For sure. Mate, there you go. Small world, mate. And that, yeah, because we were in this like super coach chat and all of a sudden this poker thing got brought up and everyone's thrown in their bad beats. It's like, Oh no, really? And so we'll, we'll talk. We're like, no, nah, we have to do this. You all have to get together and, uh, and, and get together for a, for a nice poker game, mate. So I reckon Abs yeah, well, with his seven twos going to crack a few of us, mate. He'll be a good bluffer. I reckon that Godfather, mate. So. Well, I know, I know Chris is up here and the rest of it, but we could definitely work something out. Even if it's a poker table down there, dude, I'm keen. Like, awesome, yeah. mate. So we just need little yeah. cameras so you can see the cards and all that. How good would that be if you had the oh, full setup? Man, everyone, like... everyone, just bring your own. Everyone, bring your mic, and then I reckon you could actually hook up your mic into your into the um the drink cups. Yeah, you know, the boom mics. I reckon you could put the the arm. You could probably hook the arms up into your 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 um your cup stand, and I then put a little put a little webcam. Put your little your camera in on the thing and get all the angles up, and then we'll edit it up after. That'll be hilarious. Oh, that'd, that'd so, be awesome, man. We, we've got to only, do this only, mate, on the bucket list. I only say mine because I have a 10-seater poker table and I've got about 55 bottles of whiskey and a couple oh, of cigars. Mate, so what that's more can what I was like, for, mate, apart from good company? Well, I've been, 
I've been stockpiling before the kids go to school. So <laughs> I've been <laughs> it's because once once I go to school, like life's over as far as spending on on booze. So I've been uh, stockpiling yeah. a little bit. Nice but work. There you go. Mate. APL. Look, if you've made it an hour and thirty minutes, let us know if you've enjoyed this content. I think about forty five minutes in, we're like, oh yeah, and then fifty minutes, and then we just yeah. letting loose. Couldn't believe it was an hour and a half, mate. But uh, look, time flies when you're when you're talking to a good mate, uh, just about life and super coach and footy and now poker and shit. We got into a bit of stuff there, Benny. But that's what happens when you don't have the script, mate. And uh, I think oh. it worked out very well, mate, for the first time. Yep. Let us know if you are an APL member out there, and if you are interested. Um, yeah, let us know your bad beat. Let us know your favorite footy fan as well. So growing up in the in the um, you know, with the AFL, who do you support growing up or uh, also, let us know any of your favorite memories of AFL because that's the thing I really want to hear out in this chat. So I just want to see, you know, the favorite memories you have growing up, uh, heartache, whatever it is, whatever brings you back to football. And um, yeah, if you have anything going on, chat to someone, and that's it. Super coach with DR, mate. Lovely to have you. And um, I'll see you in two weeks. And if you think of anything you want us to cover, let us know. But this is episode one, done, dusted, and we'll talk to you next time. Look forward to it. Cheers, mate. All right. Bye.